Father, we love you. And I thank you for the opportunity today to be able to share your word. I thank you, Lord, for all of the life that you've given me and abundant life that you've given me up to this point. But, Lord, for these few moments, there's nothing more important than me being a vessel that you can flow through and that you can touch the hearts and the lives of the people that are in our hearing today. I pray, God, that you'll just come in your strength and in your power and that you'll help me to God to faithfully deliver the things that you've placed into my heart. Um, and allow them to become a reality for those that are here today. Be with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I, Pastor asked me, it's been about a month since he asked me, and it's just like all of a sudden I just knew pretty much what I wanted to say up until about mid middle of this week. <laughs> and uh, if you've ever if you've ever felt like you wanted to speak the voice of God. Maybe you've experienced that where all you know all of a sudden all of that stuff uh, was not the focus. And so about middle of this week, the Lord began to speak to me, and, and not probably in small part because of the fact of the things that are going on in Israel over the past few weeks. Um, and when you begin to look, uh, Clarence and I were driving the other day, and we were just talking in the car, maybe with the kids as well, I don't remember, but we were just talking about the fact that a couple of days before there was relative peace in the Middle East. Uh, you weren't hearing all of this stuff that's going on. And then just overnight, we have this uprising, we have this terrorist attack, and we have uh, people that are being slaughtered and killed and, and all of this stuff that's going on over there. And then within just another couple of days, all of a sudden, we've moved warships into range of, of Israel to the place to where we're possibly looking at everything that the book of Revelation is telling us about. And if you've been around church any length of time, you know at least relatively some of the stuff that goes on in the book of Revelation. And so we've come from a place of relative quiet over one day, and three or four days later, all of a sudden, we're potentially facing the Battle of Armageddon. I mean, that's just a reality. And I don't say that to frighten you or anything I think that it's really important that we be aware of how quickly something like this can turn and how quickly we can be from where we walk the walk that we're walking here as Christians till we're actually walking into the very end times I mean that's how close it can happen I mean I don't know what's going to happen and I'm not here to to frighten you and to scare you I just want you to be aware of how quick it can develop because before we get done here today we could be in the middle of it or this thing could just settle back down and, and everything could just completely go away, okay? And so I think that it's important that we be aware of that, especially as Christian people, because what we've gotten to in, our, in, our, in Christian culture is we've gotten to a place to where that we just kind of rock along and we just kind of let things go and develop as they will. And for us as individuals, we don't necessarily feel the importance of moving into a deeper place in God. And that's what we've got to do. And what we've got to do is put ourselves in a position to where that we feel that all the time. I want to read, um, a, you know, when you think about the end times and you think about the book of Revelation, and let's just do that for a moment. You know, there's terrible things that happen. But the good thing is for you and I as Christians, if we're walking where we need to be, all that stuff's not going to have any effect on us. You know, I know people that don't want to read the book of Revelation because it's so awful. And, you know, and they're afraid of what it's going to mean. But for me, the book of Revelation has no meaning except for the early part where it says that we're going to go and to begin to spend eternity with him. We're going to be raptured out. We're going to be uh, with him for eternity through, while all this awful stuff is happening here on the earth. And so I want to just look at what, God has to say to the church as he begins. The book of Revelation is a prophetical book. Prophetical books, we started studying this a little bit in our Sunday school class. Prophetical book is just giving a warning um, of, about what is going to come. If you're right with God, everything's good. If you're not right with God, it's bad. 
and that's the thing that we need to understand about any prophetical book, okay? And so chapters 2 and chapter 3, and I encourage you to read it. We're not going to read all the way through both of those chapters. But it speaks directly to the audience that the book of Revelation is directed to, and that is to the seven churches. In that day, they would, they would send a letter to these seven churches, and then they would kind of spread the message out from those seven places, okay? And so we have letters to seven different churches, and the first one of those is found in Revelation chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 7, um, which says, um, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who have said they are apostles, and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, so that's a, um, that is really just the beginning of the, really the introduction and, and talking to these seven churches. And, and I picked that one because of the fact that it says, uh, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from this place because I believe this is where the church is at. I think the church has come to a place to where this deeds of the Nicolaitans that it's talking about, it's about complacency and it's about compromise. And I think that we as a church culture, not necessarily Wellspring Church, but as a church culture, we've come to a place to where that we've compromised the gospel that's been given to us. And I think that it's really important, especially as we see these last days coming or becoming more aware that those last days could be here upon us at any moment, that we come to a place to where that we truly uh, will take a step back and will um, repent and do those first works, okay? So chapters 2 and 3 are written to all the seven different churches. It talks about hypocrisy. It talks about blasphemy. I'm not going to, again, not going to go into all of that, it talks about compromise or this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It mentions it a couple of times in these uh, seven, these seven groupings within chapter two and three. Talks about sexual immorality. Talks about being lukewarm. Talks about all of those things. And so, whenever you begin to read this stuff, somebody asked me the other day. I, I, I shared kind of what I was going to share with uh, my Thursday morning Bible study group that I meet with every week. And uh, one of them said, well, isn't that kind of a scare tactic to try to get people to follow God? And I just said, well, if it is, it, if it works, then good. You know, I think that we have to employ every means to try to get people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that wasn't John the Revelator's purpose. It was not a scare tactic but it was simply a warning about the realities of the choices that we make and it's the same in all prophecy when that prophecy is written uh, it's to correct the problem that's being seen it's to it's to make us aware of the things that we're doing wrong so that that we'll correct that and we'll begin to move into the right path and so it is just a warning and within these two chapters we find both positive and negative realities he says also to be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life so that's a positive thing that, that John says to these letter, in these letters to the church he also says but hold fast what you have until I come and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him I will give power over the nations he says I'll give to each of you according to your works now that's one of those that kind of go either way right because if, if they're good works, then he's going to give us good things. 
if, if our works are negative, if, if they're evil, then we're going to receive evil because of it. Then he goes and he says, Repent, or else I'll come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He also says in those two chapters that, that if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I cannot stand that. I cannot stand with you. He says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Translates vomit out of, you, out of my mouth. And the good thing about all of these letters, he ends every one of them, because, again, it's a warning. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's a call to a deeper walk with him. It's a call to a deeper place in him. It's a call to be with him and to be in relationship with him and to walk with him in that relationship. I wanted to bring another... Um, really it's more of a prayer um, but as they were setting up Solomon's temple um, Solomon prays or God really spoke to Solomon this this phrase and again it's about um, moving into a place where we need to be and that's 2nd Chronicles seven fourteen, and you're familiar with it if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. Uh, to me, that has been the watchword. It just seemed like it just came, um, came more real in my spirit over the last couple of years than, than anything. And, and so, again, this is the reason that John wrote this letter, is he's calling his people. I think it's always interesting. Second Chronicles says, If my people who are called by my name... And all of these letters, these seven letters, are written to the church. They're not written to the lost out in the land. They're not written to the people that we think in here, well, go get them, God, you know. But these, these things are written to you and I as God's people because we've moved into him, we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we've accepted him as, um, as, as our Savior, to whatever degree, but then we begin to get complacent. We begin to get uh, to a place to where that all of a sudden God's not quite as important to us as he may have been in another another time. I've been talking about this, and, and uh, if you're in my Sunday school class, you're going to hear some things because I'm just kind of a one-track mind guy. And so as I've been preparing this, I probably have shared some of these things in my Sunday school class, and I'm going to run through this really quickly, but I've run across something called practical atheism. And, uh, and it's something that, again, just kind of quickened into my spirit when I ran across it. Um, and I'm going to just give you five real quick comparisons between real atheists and practical atheists, okay? Number one, atheists <clears throat> don't pray because they don't believe in God. Practical atheists believe in God but often have a weak or non-existent prayer life. I want you to just take a minute and think about that. Do you pray? Do you spend time in prayer? Do you spend time alone with God? Number two, atheists don't read, study, and meditate on Scripture because they believe the Bible is a fictitious book, a hoax, and a sham. Practical atheists believe the Bible is the Word of God, but rarely read or study it. Meddling today, right? Number three, atheists boast that they don't need God and they get along every day without Him in their lives. Practical atheists occasionally acknowledge God on the Sundays they attend church, but seem to live without him the rest of the week. Again, just let that settle into your spirit and think about it, and if the shoe fits, wear it, okay? Number four, atheists don't have family devotions because they see no need. Practical atheists don't have family devotions because they don't have time. Okay? Number five, atheists live for today, focus on this life, lay up their treasures on earth. Ironically, practical atheists do the same thing. So, statistics will tell us that most Christians don't pray. That they don't read their Bibles. I mean, there's, there's surveys that have been taken. And the amount of time that Christian people, even pastors, spend in prayer and in Bible study is frightening. And it's no wonder that the church has gotten to the place that it's gotten and to where the, the people in the world want nothing to do with us quite a bit of the time. 
We don't focus on God enough. We don't allow God to be a part of everything that's going on in our lives. There's two reasons for practical atheism. Um, there's probably more, two of them that I came up with. <clears throat> One of them is spiritual laziness or complacency. Um, and the other one is bad beginnings or bad teaching. Um, and, you know, as I was kind of reflecting over those things, you know, I think I used to think that the reason that a lot of people were practicing or practical atheists, I didn't know that terminology, but I, you know, I, I think I thought that the reason that people didn't move in towards God was because of laziness. But as I become involved with this other group that I teach on Thursday mornings, I've got a multi-denominational uh, group. And I find out that there's a lot of places to where it's just bad teaching. And the reality is that if you want people to move in towards God, you've got to get them to unlearn some stuff that they've learned in order for them to move in deeper and to understand what a deeper, intimate relationship with God is really all about. I used to think it was laziness, but I really think that a large part of it is uh, because of bad teaching. See, we got whole groups that have placed all the emphasis and all the importance on getting saved, but we don't put very much emphasis on being saved or on staying saved. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we got groups that, that, you know, if they can get you to the altar, um, they got, they got another chalk mark up, and there's another soul for the kingdom, and, and they're done with you. But discipleship is so important. And moving into God and understanding what it means to become closer to God every single day, that's an absolutely important part of it. You know, getting saved like that does give you a certain amount of security towards um, eternity, towards being able to spend eternity in heaven. It gives you a certain amount of that, but I'm not sure it gives you as much as people would like you to believe because I don't believe that if you make one profession of faith when you're eight years old and you never think about God again, I'm not really sure that that's enough to secure you into heaven, okay? I'm not judging anybody. Uh, and I have moved a little bit closer to where that I don't think it's as easy for us to fall out of heaven as I might have used to, but I do think um, that there is such a thing as backsliding. I do think that there's such a thing as not pursuing God to the place to where that you secure uh, your eternity in heaven. Um, that getting saved was all about making heaven our home, and certainly salvation does include that and involves that, but it's so much more than just that. Scripture talks so much about the abundant life that we're supposed to be living here on this earth in preparation for heaven. John 10.10 10 says, I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. And we don't talk about the abundant life much anymore. But the reality is that you ought to be doing the things that that guy was talking about. You ought to be involved with that, okay? Not anything about me, but if you move in close to God, you're going to want to do things for the kingdom. You're going to want to see the kingdom go forward. You're going to want to move forward in him and to be what he wants us to be. Living that kind of life where you have this experience um, at the altar and then nothing more to it is kind of like going to Lambert's. Everybody like Lambert's? So what kind of an idiot would you be if you went to Lambert's and ordered your meal and then when they came around with all of that good stuff, the pass arounds and the hot rolls and said, no, I don't want any of that. I just want the meal. You think anybody ever went? I wouldn't go to Lambert's for that. Food's good, but it's not that good. You know what I'm saying? It, it would be a, it, 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 that's, that's kind of what they're doing is when we just say, okay, well, I'm saved. I've got it made, and then I'm just going to live the way ever I want to from here on. It's kind of like going to Lambert's and not taking the pass arounds in the throat rolls. <clears throat> I think that one of the problems within the church is that we haven't challenged new converts to be all that they can be in Christ in this life as well as in the life to come. You see, if we truly believe that God is who he says that he is 
and that he can and he has done all that he says that he's done for us, we'd read his word. We wouldn't be that group of people that just leaves it set on the lampstand or sits on the coffee table and only get, picks it up to bring it to church, which we're not even doing that anymore. Most of us have it in our, in our phones. But if we truly believed that this was the oracles of God, if we truly believed this was God speaking to us, we'd, we'd, we'd get it out and we'd spend time. Matter of fact, we would have nothing more important to do than to find out what it is that God was speaking to us. Everybody wants to know God's will for their life. It's there. It's right there. All you got to do is read it and allow it to settle down deep into your spirit. But our American culture says that we enter into this relationship with an attitude almost like, I'll try it out for a little while, and I'll see if it works for me, and then I'll decide if I really want to continue in this thing. Or they just continue in it anyway just because they're supposed to be here in church on Sunday, because they're supposed to be here because they know people are looking at them, whatever reason, all the different reasons that we have. They just say, I'll just try it out for a little while and see if it works for you. And here's the thing about that. In the American culture, you can kind of get away with that. Most places around the world, many places, I won't say most, but many places around the world, you make that kind of a commitment, you're putting your life on the line and maybe giving up your life just by simply making a confession of faith and being baptized and those kind of things. You see, our emphasis, again, I'm not talking about Wellspring so much as I am the church culture as a whole. Our emphasis has been on getting saved rather than on being saved. Getting saved speaks to me about doing something in my own efforts at a point in time. That's getting saved. But being saved is a lifetime commitment to follow Christ wherever he may lead me. No matter what that path may bring, you're willing to do whatever that is. Being saved requires learning to hear his voice in the midst of all of life's distractions. And, and, and every one of us have those. Matter of fact, every one of you got up this morning and had to make a decision. Am I going to go to church? I'm not really feeling that well. Um, you know, every one of us had to make that choice. And the bad thing is it has become easier and easier for us to say, you know what, they won't miss me. You know, it's not that important. Because of one thing, and this showed up very clearly during COVID, because even the government decided that the church was non-essential. Because you and I, again, not you and I, but as a representative of our church culture, we've made the world think that we think that we're not essential. And the reality is that in a time like what happened during COVID, there was nothing more important that should have been done. I got, I got an auto parts store, and we were considered essential. And we worked every single day through that thing. But the church was shut down because many reasons, but again, because we as a church, for the church culture has allowed ourselves to become so, well, really non-essential to the world, to where that they thought, you know what, we can do without it for these months. These, you know, in some cases, m many months. We were, we were fighting it every step of the way. And, uh, and whenever there was an opportunity for us to come back by making, rearranging seats and those kind of things, we were here. And we never stopped broadcasting. But there are those that completely shut down, and many of them are not even here today because of it. Okay? Um, we live in a world full of distractions. And you and I need something to help us to work through those distractions, and the way that we do that is by becoming people of his word and spending time with God, listening to the right things on the radio, uh, watching the right kind of things on TV, spending our time building up the inner man, building up the man that's within us. Um, and and I, again, I want to go back to what I think is the problem is that we haven't been taught 
what that really means. How do I do that? How do I really move into intimate relationship with God? An intimate relationship that he had created us for. An intimate relationship that he placed within us a desire for, but he wants it even more than we do. How do we move into that place? And I have that question asked to me, and, and I never have exactly the right answer because for me, I believe that's a decision that every one of us has to make. God, you need to be on your knees before God saying, God, how do I move into a deeper place in you? How do I know you more? How do I know you better? But you've got to make that decision on your own. But the problem is that we've taught people that you get saved, you got eternity secure, and, and so you're good. But there's so much more. And we ought to be moving into that place. The, here's what it is. It's a supernatural, it's a spiritual battle that we have chosen to fight in our own strength, just like coming to the altar in our own strength. We haven't taught people that it's a spiritual, supernatural thing that's going on and that, and that in your own power, you're never going to move into intimacy with God. You're never going to be able to do it until you begin to allow your spirit to take over and to carry you into those places where God is. God's everywhere, okay? But the problem is we got so much self in the way to where that he can't get to us and we can't get to him, you know? Um, I used to sing a song. Um, sorry, it left me. Not going to come back either. We'll move on from that. <laughs> That's the thing about being 66 <laughs> and being here for 57 years. If it comes back, I'll, I'll let you have it. But <laughs> Okay. So anyway, it is a supernatural spiritual battle, but what we've done is we've chosen, just like that we made that profession of faith at the altar, that we're going to figure out what it is within our own minds. How are we going to... How are we going to fight this battle? How are we going to move into this place? The reality is that the fight's already been won. What we've got to do is release our control and trust in the power of his might. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 uh, says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, okay? I want you to particularly focus on verse 12, because when you read this passage of Scripture, we always want to talk about the armor, and it's vitally important that we understand. But right nestled right in the middle of that, little statement about the armory is a reality that I don't think that we quite grasp that says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Again, we got a tendency to think, well I made my confession of faith and now I'm going to muscle through and I'm going to put on this armor and I'm going to become God's greatest warrior ever in my own strength, okay? The focus becomes, what do I do in taking up the armor rather than recognizing the spiritual nature of this fight? And that's the thing that we've got to get to. We've got to move beyond our thinking, our natural thinking, into a supernatural thinking that's going on all the time if we will allow it to happen. And that comes through allowing the Holy Spirit to become a part of our lives. You can choose to fight your way through to victory in your own strength. You, that's the choice that we do make most of the time. Or you can continue to beg God to sovereignly intervene and help you to receive the results that you desire as far as being that great warrior of God. But to me, that's a bad waste of spiritual effort. It's a bad waste of spiritual effort because what we really need to do is to ask him to transform us from the inside out through this inward renewal, okay? I'm going to use an illustration that I've used. I know my Sunday school class has seen it, and my kids love it, hate it when I do it. But if you have ever been in an orchard, 
just walking out through the orchards, blossom time, and the fruit's just starting to put on. Have you ever noticed as you walk through there, you don't hear anything going on up in the tree? You don't hear that fruit up there going, mm, I want to be an apple. None of that's going on. There's no straining. There's no, what happens? That apple, first of all, becomes a blossom. And then it becomes an apple, and it grows, and it grows, and grows. Why does it grow? It's, it grows because it's attached to the tree. It's attached to the source of nourishment. It's attached to the things that will help it to grow. It's organic. And see, that's what this walk that we're talking about here needs to be. Instead of us going to the altar and doing our thing, and again, I'm not trying to belittle what happens at the altar because that certainly is the starting point. But if it becomes the starting point and the end point, then it's, it's useless. I mean, it really is. It's not what God intended, okay? This ought to be an organic thing that happens to us from the inside out, from the beginning of our walk with him at the altar to the place to where that we begin to, um, to blossom and then to begin to grow and to become what God wants us to be. And so if you've been a Christian for any length of time and you don't see that growth taking place, Scripture's full about talking about the fruit of the spirit and the things that ought to be being seen in your life if you can take a moment and you should every single day to look within and see god do you see do i see growth taking place am i growing in you am i becoming more like what you want me to be um if you're not seeing that then you need to get on your knees before god and you need to pick up the word of god and say okay god what am i doing wrong where am i where am i wrong in this whole process okay Again, this needs to be an inward renewal. It needs to be something that happens from the inside out. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And in verse 2, this is the one I want you to grasp. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so that passage of Scripture tells us, first of all, and I think we have this one down. We understand what it means. I don't know that we have it down, but we understand what it means when it says to not be conformed to this world. Because you've heard many, many sermons that are about not conforming. And that'll come in a lot of different iterations about thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not. Uh, but the reality is, again, the Holy Spirit needs to come to you and tell you what that means for you to not be conforming to this world. But we have a tendency to forget about the second part of that little passage that says, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so if you really want to become that great soldier for the kingdom of God, if you really want to be that, then you've got to allow your mind to be transformed, um, to be renewed, our mind to be renewed, and therefore bringing transformation into spiritual man. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to just give you five little quick things and a couple of scriptures uh, to tie on to that. One of them is you need to spend quiet time with God. You want your, uh, your mind to be uh, renewed and your spirit to be transformed. Spend quiet time with God. What I'm talking about here is turning some stuff off. Okay? The TV. Not all the time. Nothing wrong with watching TV. I say that because I watch TV. Uh, you know, but sometimes you just got to shut off all the noise. Sometimes you just got to get away from the counter at Delta Auto Parts. My dad used to, back when I was working with him years ago, he would say, hey, I just, I just got to go walk a little while. And he'd just disappear off the counter, and, and I'd find him out in the alley. We was in we one block he just walk up and down back there and that was just him being quiet before the lord and allowing god to speak to him we need to find a time like that we need to have that if we want our mi minds to be renewed and our spirits to be transformed memorizing scripture okay um again if you've been in my sunday school class memorizing scripture is not as important as it getting down in your spirit but if you'll memorize scripture it will get down in your spirit so you need to spend time. And the only way that you're going to 
memorize scripture is that you do number three and that is study your Bible take time get it off of that uh, nightstand spend time with it don't just wait till the next time you come to church to even open it up or see what it has to say study your Bible number four pray again one of those things that practical atheists have a tendency not to do um, but to pray for the renewing of your mind because there's no better aid to that renewal than, the, than God being a part of that thing happening. And then number five is capture negative thoughts. Um, Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay, so he's giving you a whole list of things there in Philippians 4.8 to think about positive you're going to have negative thoughts that are going to come into your mind what you need to do is just to override that with scripture and with these positive things just like he says if you got to something comes into your mind flip over to Philippians 4 8 just begin to read it and think about those things things that are true noble right pure lovely admirable anything that's excellent and praiseworthy those are the things that we need to be focused on Another passage of scripture that I wanted to bring kind of into this thought process, and I'm kind of getting towards the end. Um, don't you just hate it when preachers do that? 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're to cast those things aside. We're to not let those things overtake our minds. Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, that mean, that may be some kind of a program you may be watching. That may be somebody speaking into your life that is not speaking the oracles of God. And it says, goes on and it says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. There's that transformation that's taking place. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay? So my calling to you today is that you would, first of all, acknowledge where you're at spiritually. And then to allow the things to take place within you that will bring that change. I got a video that I showed to my Sunday school class a few weeks ago that I wanted to show to you. Uh, and, and I want to I just have a few words about it after it's done. But if you'll bear with us for about, I think it's about a four or five minute video. But I want you to look at what happens to this little girl um, as she is quoting scripture. Go ahead and start that video. This is great. This is an important question right here. Okay, you guys ready? Yes. One of you is going to get it. Here we go. All right, here's your last passage. Both riches and honor come Madison. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Sorry, that is incorrect. For the rest of you, Bethany. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. That is correct. Please recite it. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou. The Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Oh Lord, you are the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand 
is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. Bethany, bring us into your heart and mind. What was going on there? I just realized how powerful and in control God is and how everything is just because of him and he's so great and amazing. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the way the word of God should impact us. Praise God. That's awesome. That's what this is all about. You know, there's two different ways that we come to know the Word of God. One is intellectually, that's with our mind, and the other is experientially with our heart. What you just did right there was experienced God's Word in your life. You were living from the inside out. We didn't get a chance to see what was going on in your head. We got a chance to see what was inside your heart. Right. And that's what God wants more than anything. And that's what makes a testimony. Amen. Right there is that we're living from the inside out. You see, all religions have two things in common. There's belief and there's behavior. Hmm. But we're not about a religion. We're about a relationship. And we still have belief, our belief about God, and it affects our behavior. But there's a really fascinating thing that happens between those two. It's called become. We believe in Jesus Christ. We become God's son. And now on the basis of who we are inside, we behave. We don't have to try to act like God. We don't have to try to act like Jesus. We just simply let his love rest in our heart and then it comes out. Right. Just like we saw it come out right there, Bethany. Amen. I'm proud of you. I am really proud of Amen. you. That was awesome. That was awesome. Every time I see that, I ran across the video probably year ago and just every now and then I'll play it again and never fails to bring tears to my eyes because really and truly it's exactly what we're talking about here it's about moving from a place those kids I've actually competed against some of those kids embarrassingly so at, at a Lions Club meeting we had a few weeks ago they memorized the scripture to the point to where that I mean it's just like it just flows out of them and they can um, take a scripture reference and then quote it just like that from the top of their head and so they spend a lot of time memorizing scripture and so her motivation for memorizing scripture was to do well on this national bible bee but what happened is she began to quote it was exactly what we're talking about there was a transformation that was taking place by the power of the word now I've talked about a lot of different things that we can do but I absolutely believe that there's nothing more important for this transformation to take place than for us to be people of the word. And I think that's the thing that sets us apart and that's the thing that keeps us from being all that we can be is that we're not people of the word. And so there will be an encouragement to you, hopefully, to dig in. And here's what I find out about studying God's word. The more I study it and the more I know it, the more I want to know and the more I realize that I don't know about it and the deeper I want to go. And so... You go, well, it's, it's boring when I sit down to read it. Well, for these kids, it probably, no doubt, was boring for them too. But look what happened to Bethany. Look what happened to her because she had, Im she had embedded the Word of God into her heart. And it brought change from the inside out and through her mind and through every other part of her being. And she was just broken when she all of a sudden realized the, the awesomeness of the words that she was speaking. And that's what will happen to us as we become people of the word, as we spend time with God, as we put ourselves in a place to where that God can renew our minds and transform us in our spirit. In closing, literally this time, um, Joshua 24, 15, um, the children of Israel had just come out of Egyptian bondage um, and they, um, they were, had moved into the promised land and Joshua stands before the people and he says this now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord and if you if it seem evil to you unto you to serve the Lord choose you this day whom you will serve 
whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But Joshua says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? Stand with me. You know, this is one of those messages. It's not necessarily a salvation message other than the fact that you may have come to a place in your Christian walk to where you realize you were stagnant or you were stalemated. Um, and what I wanted to present to you today, and obviously this is not anything new. Um, you've heard these verses. Um, you know, I wanted to bring you something brand new, and but the reality is the most important thing that we can do is to step back. Um, I titled this message Back to the Future because that's the thing that we need to do is we need to go back and do the first works. I believe that as a church culture, not everybody, but many of us need to go back and do those first works and recognize what's important. And it's not that we come together and see each other each week, which is a wonderful part of being a part of the body of Christ. But the thing that we need to happen and it's every one of our responsibility is that we would meet God when we come into this place. And that starts with a hunger and with a desire for every one of us that as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord, whatever that takes and however that may happen. As the, they begin to play and sing this morning um, as a way of an altar call, I just invite you to come. If God has spoken to your heart, and I'll tell you this, I never speak, but where God has already just done a work in me and has already called me, I, I don't think I could do it any other way. And so, even in the preparation this morning, I see a need for a deeper place in Him. And I promise you this, that if you ever wake up and say, well, I've gotten where I need to be with God, that's the moment that you need to step back. Because every single day, every one of us can move in just a little bit closer, just a little bit further. Because here's the thing. Your family, your friends and neighbors, your co-workers, all of those people are depending on you to be all you can be and to let them see Jesus in you every single day. So if you have a hunger and a desire to move in deeper to God, I just invite you again just to come to the altar raise your hands, pray, and say, God, I, I acknowledge I'm not everything that I need to be in you, and I trust you to take me where I need to go. And so as the band plays, you join me if you would.